It's another tough act to follow. They say you can't follow children in choirs, I guess. This morning's first scripture reading from the New Testament, from the Gospel of Matthew, from the Gospel of Mark, excuse me. The 10th chapter, verses 32 through 45. And if you're using a red church Bible, that begins on page 980. Again, the 10th chapter of Mark, verses 32 through 45. They were on their way up to Jerusalem with Jesus leading the way and the disciples were astonished while those who followed were afraid. Again, he took the 12 aside and told them what was going to happen to him. We are going to Jerusalem, he said, and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and the teachers of the law. They will condemn him to death and they will hand him over to the Gentiles who will mock him and spit on him, flog him and kill him. Three days later, he will rise. Then James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to him. Teacher, they said, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. What is it that you want me to do for you? He asked. They replied, let one of us sit at your right and the other at your left in your glory. You don't know what you are asking, Jesus said. Can you drink the cup I drink or be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with? We can, they answered. Jesus said to them, you will drink the cup I drink and be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with. But to sit at my right or left is not for me to grant. These places belong to those for whom they have been prepared. When the 10 heard about this, they became indignant with James and John. Jesus called them together and said, you know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first must be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his word. Thank you. Our second reading this morning is also from Mark's Gospel, chapter 11, verses 1 through 14. And it is found on, the, on page 981 of the Red Church Bible. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethpage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and just as you enter it, you'll find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you doing this? Tell him the Lord needs it, and will send it back here shortly. They went and found a colt outside in the street, tied at the doorway. As they untied it, some people there, standing there asked, What are you doing untying that colt? They answered as Jesus had told them, so, told them to, and the people let them go. When they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks over it, he sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the road, while others spread branches they had cut in the fields. Those who went ahead and those who followed shouted, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord! Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David! Hosanna in the highest! Jesus entered Jerusalem and went to the temple. 
He looked around at everything, but since it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. The next day, as they were leaving Bethany, Jesus was hungry. Seeing in the distance a fig tree and leaf, he went to find out if it had any fruit. When he reached it, he found nothing but leaves, because it was not the season for figs. Then he said to the tree, may no one ever eat fruit from you again. And his disciples heard him say it. This is the word of our Lord. Let's commit this time to prayer. Uh, Heavenly Father, we give you our hearts this morning, and may we hear your, your voice. Uh, to that end, I pray. Amen. So, uh, folks, as we celebrate Palm Sunday this morning, you know, often our approach is this. We come to uh, a passage like this. We've read it before. We've heard it before. Tell me something new about an old, old story. And in many cases, what we are is creatures of habit. You know, we're not unlike the animals. We're very rote and we're very behavioral. And we look at passages in the same way, the same passage, the same way, the same eye set, often with the same knowledge and perspective. Uh, I'm guilty of this as a pastor. Uh, what I've done for the last 30 years is I've picked a Psalm, uh, a Palm Sunday passage, just very, very specifically related to Jesus entering Jerusalem. For, forget about all the events that happened the rest of the week. I've never delved, it, delved into them. Uh, always have limited it to his entry, because that's what Palm Sunday is, right? Well, this morning, I'm going to try to challenge the status quo here today as we, as we look at the passage. So what I've done is I've included a scripture that goes beyond the first day, and we have the, uh, the, the, um, the cursing of the, of the fig tree. And, and so this morning, as uh, I encourage you and um, encourage you to challenge the status quo, uh, I think we, we all do that when we come with a childlikeness to approach the scripture in such a way where we don't say, oh, I've heard that before, or oh, I know that, or oh, I have the same perspective. And I pray that we approach it this morning with the dependency upon the Holy Spirit that would open the eyes of our heart, uh, that he would open the eyes of the blind. Because we're all blind, aren't we? We're all blind to see everything that is in, 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 in any passage. Uh, by the way, it, it's, it's, I think, significantly profound. If you take a look at the two passages of Scripture this morning, selected in Mark, you know what is sandwiched in between them? Is Bartimaeus where God opens the eyes of the blind Bartimaeus. And so I was thinking it's, it's kind of appropriate because we all fall into that category. We all need our eyes open by Christ to see him, don't we? We do. So uh, I was drawn to Mark's account uh, this morning for several reasons. One is I believe that the Holy Spirit led me to this passage. I pray every week that God would give me a word. And whether it comes out of my own heart, whether it comes out of a circumstance, whether it's something that somebody else says, every week I pray for a word. Because every week all you folks come in here with a different need. God knows that need I don't, right? I'll work through a book on Sunday school, Wednesday morning. I've tried to do it Sunday morning. And every so often I guess it works, but I'm just generally not led that way. But I, you know, sometimes that's why Heidi and... Uh, Janelle don't get the inf and Mim don't get the information until sometimes Friday afternoon because God hasn't given me a word. But I believe the Holy Spirit led me to this passage. Secondly, I've been intrigued because Mark, of the three synoptic gospel writers, has the shortest account. John's account is pretty short about Palm Sunday too, but Mark's is relatively different. It's very short. And I've always stayed away from Mark because it doesn't seem to have that much material? Well, I didn't stay away because there was any shortness of material. 
And the, the other thing is, too, is I think that God led me back to Mark because remember several weeks ago we had looked at the foot washing in John chapter 13, the night before Jesus was crucified? And, I, and, I, and you'll see how that ties in because Mark's theme of his gospel is about servanthood. Now, you may know this, but uh, the gospel writers come with a different lens and a different perspective. It's no different um, that if two people came to your house and you had flowers, uh, say, on the kitchen table, and then you had a coffee pot on the counter, all right? Uh, if, if I'm there, I'm one of the two people, I notice the coffee pot. You see? Somebody else may notice the flowers. That's how it works. And so Matthew writes and presents Christ as king. Luke presents him as a man. John presents him as divine, and Mark presents him as the servant, a suffering servant. Now, uh, this is amazing because I, I didn't get through all the commentaries I wanted to for this, but oh my goodness, I, I was reading where scholars look at Mark's account and they say, man, this is a literary clumsy version. I'm thinking, how can God's word be a literary, clumsy version? Mark wrote it the way he wrote it, because the Holy Spirit led him to write it in that way. And those are not my words. Those are, those are words of the scholars, right? They analyze everything, and yet they miss the heart of Christ on the very pages of Scripture. Take a look at Matthew uh, Mark, I'm sorry, Mark 10, verse 45. It's right across the page. This is the theme of Mark. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. That, brothers and sisters, that's a precious, precious verse. I love how someone expressed this. He came to serve through his incarnate body and now he ministers through his mystical body, that is the church, to serve the world. Isn't that beautiful? You know, so last month we looked at John 13 foot washing. And I said, and I'm missing a page here, I said that there is nothing, there is nothing that God would not do for us when it comes to humility. Peter had to learn that before he could minister the way Christ wanted him to. Mark 10 teaches us that James and John had to learn that before they could minister Christ the way they were supposed to. I look at this passage of Scripture and it says to every single disciple, we need to learn the humility and the servanthood of Christ if we are to share him in any way. Now, the other thing here is this. If you notice, Mark's account uh, mentions that two disciples were sent. Who did he send? Was it, was it James and John? <laughs> well, when you talk about a lesson in humility, hey guys, uh, forget about sitting next to me. Uh, go get the donkey. <laughs> I don't know if it was James or John. I don't know. Uh, some say it was Peter and another disciple. But if it was Peter then it just reinforces the event because Peter, you know, later in the week, didn't want his feet washed, right? And if anything, this is an exercise to see the servant king. So what we have here this morning are two main stories. We have Christ's entry into Jerusalem. We have the cursing of the fig tree. And I want to extract two principles out of that that are foundational where you can draw many, many other applications. So the first principle here uh, comes out of the entry. Christ has come to serve. The second principle here is that God looks for fruitfulness. Those are the two principles. The lesson of servanthood starts and ends with Christ, and the lesson of fruitfulness starts and ends with Christ. It's as simple as that. And so this is what I see here. As the serving king comes to serve, if we receive him in this way, then God will find fruit and more fruit. And if we reject him, then it's clear that it leads to a fruitlessness experience. 
Remember the night before Jesus died in John chapter 15, we have the parable of the vine and the branches. You know it well. Some people want to say it's a passage about losing your salvation. It's got nothing to do with that. It's about losing fruitfulness. And Jesus stressed this principle. That when we abide in him, we're fruitful. And only in him is our service fruitful to others. Otherwise, it's all burned up. It's, it's but dust. So everything I say this morning will fall into the category of these two principles. Christ came to serve. God looks for fruitfulness. Take a look at the first story here. Uh, Christ coming uh, into Jerusalem to serve us. Now, I dare say that this principle is missed by most commentators and believers today. You know, the, the mantra is, we serve God, right? We serve God. I'm going to suggest to you that that paradigm is backward. I'll talk about that a little bit later. But that's what's at the heart of this passage. Christ comes as a servant. We don't want to reduce him to a servant because we, he, he's glorified, he's Lord. But he still acts in that way very much so. And, and the other thing I would say is this, to receive this truth requires special discernment. Uh, you know that they missed the suffering servant over 2,000 years ago. The high priest missed it. The Pharisees missed it. The scribes missed it. The Sadducees missed it. The rulers of this world missed it. And I believe that the disciples missed it. That's why Jesus had to wash their feet. And spiritual discernment is also greatly lacking today in our churches. And in our leadership. How many miss the aspect of servanthood? How many miss the quali this quality that's found in true leadership? How many miss the Savior as servant? You know, they say the proof is in the pudding. If you come to this passage, you can see it through and through that they missed it. Uh, the crowds are shouting, Hosanna! Uh, you, you, you may know this. It, it's, it means, oh, save us now. And you've also heard, too, that they're looking for the political kingdom. Uh, clearly, that's what they were doing. And they lack spiritual discernment. They never saw the spiritual kingdom. Uh, just as a side note, this is incredible. You talk about lacking discernment. Our Supreme Court has Moses and the Ten Commandments etched and written all over the building. And listen to this. Every session opens with the words, quote, God save the United States in this honorable court. And yet they roll out decisions that totally lack godly spiritual discernment. It's amazing. Totally amazing. And here's another truth that I think comes out of the aspect of servanthood when you look at this passage. And I think it's totally, totally obscure. But as Christ comes to serve, he didn't come to lord it over people. Now I want you to think about that. He came to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Because that's the nature of his kingdom. It's not of this world. I was thinking, I know of no scripture in the New Testament where it says Christ comes and seeks to lord it over people and comes to rule over people. I challenge you to give me a scripture that says that. As the great shepherd of the sheep, he leads, he guides, he restores the soul, he comes to serve. Uh, he doesn't come to lord it over or rule over. Now, in his second advent, he will come and rule and put down lawlessness. That's not any question. There's no question to that. But for now, he serves. And if he wants, uh, he does want to reign in our hearts. But that's quite different from ruling and lording it over people. We're encouraged to let him rule in our hearts. And when we do... His peace rules. So, the, Hosanna, the cry Hosanna here is purely political. It's purely a deliverance from Rome. And they totally missed 
the spiritual aspect of the kingdom, Christ coming to serve. Now, as you and I look at this passage, this side of the cross, I would suggest to you that it should take on a whole new significance for us. Hosanna, save us now, means that he's doing it. Christ does it now. I've said this, he's done it in the past. He saves us in the present. He will save us in the future. And when you first accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, he saved you then. And how he saves you now and how he saves you in the future is no different than when he saved you in the past. It's all there. You know, it's from A to Z, the Alpha and the, the Omega, the beginning and the end. It's every aspect of life. Physical life, eternal life. No one shall ever snatch them out of my Father's hand. I and the Father are one. It's never going to happen. So, He serves up salvation and He delivers us in whatever He has ordained for our lives. That we should experience His deliverance over and over and over and over again. That's what He does. He serves it up. Now, contrast this with Christ's willingness to serve with that of the earthly rulers. We have a sense of how the spiritual leaders in Israel acted. They lorded over people. They were hypocrites. They plotted his death. We have a sense of how the Roman leadership responded in Jesus' day. They carried out his execution. They ruled harshly. They oppressed the, uh, the Israelites. There was a reason why they shouted Hosanna. They wanted to get rid of Rome. Rome was brutal. Uh, we have a sense today of the tyranny that rules and reigns. There is nothing but darkness that is cast over the shadow of this land, and you know that. Uh, what, what this past year has taught us is that worldly leadership doesn't come to serve, does it? It seeks to rule and lord over. There was a time when if you be, took a public position in government, it was there to serve. Not anymore. It's to rule. It's to lord over. And this past year has taught us that many of our leaders are hypocrites. Do as I say, not as I do. You know, some of you were wearing masks. Some of those same leaders that said, wear the masks, weren't wearing the masks. How's that work? Uh, here you go. The virus is really bad, right? Why are they letting people in over the Mexican border that have the virus? That ought to tell you something. Back to Mark's account. The cult and the proper entry, and don't miss this, this is to be understood in the context of Mark's theme of the gospel. He's come to give his life a ransom for many. He's the lowly servant. Everything he does is redemptive. And he's an amazing servant. He's an incredible servant. And that is to stand in contrast to Rome and to the, to the Sanhedrin. And here's the other thing, too. Notice that tyranny comes from the religious sector and it comes from the political sector. Beware of those who serve in such a way where they want to lord it over and not serve. Here's the other thing I see here. As a servant, Jesus is resolute, determined, persevering, dauntless, and persistent in his role to serve. And I ask you this question here because I want, to, I want you to really think it. Has the Lord Jesus Christ ever not been a suffering servant to you and to me in serving up salvation and mercy and grace and strength and hope and life and joy and peace? Has he ever failed to serve in that way? Not at all. In fact, is, that, is not this what he does daily? All that he is 
he has been, all that he is, he continues to be, and all that he is, he will forever be to his people. That's, that will never change. So, all of us this morning can say, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming king and kingdom to our hearts because that's what he does daily. Every single day, he comes to us daily. Some other things to consider here that support the truth that Christ has come to serve. Take a look at the securing of the donkey. You, many of you people have studied the scriptures for years. You know that it comes out of Zechariah 9.9. It's an affirmation that Christ is Israel's king. It's an, uh, riding on a donkey is affirmation that he's the anointed one. Solomon did this on David's donkey as David was dying. And Solomon came and was, rode on David's donkey into the city and was anointed king. All the parallels are there. The political significance, the spiritual significance, the messianic significance. Think about this. He didn't do this for himself. He did it for the people. He did it for you and me. He wrote the donkey as a sign that we might know that he has come to serve and that he has come to serve us. That's how you want to understand this passage. And I know that that goes against the grain of human pride I don't want anything from people. I want to do it myself. <laughs> Passage is teaching us that Christ has to do it for us. That's why he came to serve. Now you take a look at the donkey here. Um, it represents peace, leadership, kingship, nobility. But at the very basic notion is that it's a burden bearer. It represents servitude. It represents humility. And it's inferior to a horse. Consider this passage, Mark 11 here, in light of Revelation 19. You see Christ riding in on a white horse in a military way. And yet he comes in on a donkey in a very inferior way. All the palms, all the garments also speak to royalty, but Mark wants us to see his lowliness here. And when we receive him in this way as servant king, it leads to fruitfulness. And that's an often missed principle. And that's why I want to challenge the status quo today. Think about it. A king comes to rule, but he came to serve. And he still comes to each and every one of us to serve, that we might be fruitful. Second story here. The principle, uh, uh, the second story, the cursing of the fig, fig tree and the principle of looking for fruitfulness. Now, this is the object lesson. Rejecting his service leads to fruitlessness and judgment. That's, that comes out of this here. He looks for fruitfulness, but rejecting him in this way leads to judgment. Now, take a look at verse 11. It kind of sets up the next account, but all the fanfare, fan, all the fanfare uh, ends very, very abruptly. They're shouting, they're all, and all of a sudden, uh, he goes into the temple, <laughs> and he departs. It's it very, very anticlimactic. That's why they see it as very, the scholars see it as very clumsy. I would suggest to you that we should see this as Jesus going in there and taking inventory. Kind of like as the fruit inspector. Because outwardly, you come to the majestic temple. You come to the, all the appearance of the day celebration. It's prosperous. It really, really looks good. And yet, there's nothing on the inside. There's no fruit. You know, it's the old adage, you know, you never judge a book by its cover. It looks great on the outside. <laughs> and you get in there and you say, boy, it was a shallow. I want you to notice this here. In verse 12, the cursing of the fig tree was done a day later. It was done away from the crowds and the authorities. That's significant. 
And it was for the disciples only. And it was rendering judgment on the leadership, the nation, and the temple. Now, here's the other thing, too, uh, connecting the dots. After the cursing of the fig tree, Mark talks about the cleansing of the temple. And then you go over to chapter 13, and he talks about the temple being destroyed and the city being destroyed. And the future destruction of the, of the, of the city and the temple, uh, symbolic of the nation. And this is what's so significant about it is this, is the fig tree is a symbol of Israel's peace and security and Israel's fruitfulness. And so when you look at this here, the message is clear. Israel's fruitless. That's how you understand it. Her peace and security are threatened. That's the theological message. But there's, there's actually more here than, than meets the eye. If you were to take a look at, this, at, at, at the cursing of the fig tree, you have to wonder why Jesus would look for figs on a tree when it was out of season. Fig trees bear fruit before the leaves actually come to be. So when you find green leaves on the fig tree, you would expect to find fruit. And so the object lesson here is this, is that within the object lesson, Jesus expected to find fruit on that tree, and there was nothing. Take a look at this. The, the scripture says here that he became hungry. He was, he was hungry. He was looking for fruit. And he didn't find it. Now, if I did a little study on fruit trees here, and you have about three harvests, and sometimes some fruit doesn't mature in the winter harvest, and it's carried over in the spring. And those are called winter or early figs. And so when they don't blossom in the winter, they actually are premature on the trees in the spring. And, and so Jesus expected actually to find something on the tree. And there was nothing there. And that's hugely symbolic of what he found with the nation. Now, if this weren't enough, consider this. The cursing of the fig tree actually probably occurred uh, on the Mount of Olives right next to the village of Bethpage. That, that village is actually mentioned in verse 1. Do you know what it means? <laughs> it means house of green and unripe figs. It was the village of the priests. It was where the donkeys were secured. And of, according to Matthew's gospel, and of particular note, this was the village, get this, where the Sanhedrin conducted their supreme court. They made the first place the temple. Bethpage was the other location where they had their supreme court. But most importantly, it was considered the measuring center for all things holy, all things religious, all things legal. Kind of like our Supreme Court. And if you take a look at the history here, it was a walled city right outside Jerusalem. It was actually considered to be a part of Jerusalem. But it was where all the legal decisions were made outside the city at the entrance gate. That's the significance of Bethpage. And this was where the same village where they pronounced death sentences. So when you bring it all together, it, it's very, very pregnant with meaning. And the coincidences don't stop there. It was intentionally named the house of unripe figs for two reasons. It was the belief that the tree of the knowledge of good and evil was a fig tree. Now, when we did our study in Genesis, we all agreed that it wasn't the apple tree. 
But Jewish tradition believes that it was the fig tree because what did Adam and Eve do? They clothed themselves with fig leaves. You see? Now, whether it's true or not, I don't know. But they named Beth Page the village for that very reason because the, San the Supreme Court wanted to make decisions when the fruit, w fruit was unripe because Adam and Eve ate the ripened fruit. You see the, 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 the irony in all this? Uh, the second reason is that figs were always unripe at the start of the season. And so the idea here is that when we make decisions, we, you know, unripened fruit was good, and ripened fruit was evil based on the Genesis 3 account. And to top it all off, this is probably the place where the Sanhedrin watched Christ be crucified, according to Matthew 27, verse 41. So, when you read this account here, man, Matthew just packs it right in with servanthood and fruitfulness. So, my question is, how do you take all that? How do we unpack it here this morning uh, as we look at this? Well, Israel and the leadership were steeped in the impression that they were fruitful in God. And they were not. Uh, national symbols of peace, security, and prosperity. That was the fruit tree. And, and, and yet, everything that they had was a religious veneer. It was the fruit of legalism. And it was the fruit of appearance and prosperity. And yet, there was nothing in their hearts. It had all the hallmarks of the fruitfulness of doing and yet it never yielded any fruit. Why is that? Because their fruitfulness was never found in the servant king. That's why Israel was fruitless. Uh, you know, God looked, he was hungry for fruit that day. I think that was true physically, and I think that was true spiritually. You read Luke's account, and he wept over the city. Oh, that he would find fruit that day. That broke his heart. This is the takeaway. Spiritual fruit is only found and achieved in Jesus Christ. I can't do it in my own strength. You can't do it in your own strength. And yet many times, don't we seek to do it that way? In our own strength. Uh, we, we forget and this is why we often lack fruit and we lack strength and we lack power in the Christian life. You know, I, I was reflecting on the uh, symbolism uh, of the fig tree and the knowledge of good and evil. I, and again, I don't know if that's true or not, but I started to reflect on the whole idea of fruitfulness. If you go back into the Genesis account, think about this. Everything that God did in creation was to serve Adam and Eve. Think about it. Everything he did was to serve. He didn't do it for himself. He did it for Adam and Eve. Their fruitfulness was in the garden of God. Their fruitfulness was in him. And, 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 and here's the picture. They went outside his fruitfulness to find fruit. And as they say, the rest is history. And I think this is the great deception of our day. Uh, we seek fruitfulness apart from God and it doesn't work. Uh, we see this in our churches. We see this in the preaching. Uh, we see this in our politicians. We see this in our legal rulings. We see this all over the place. We see this Sunday morning. How many people just go, go and will work Sunday morning and forget about what's most important? God says, seek first the kingdom and I'll give it, give it, I'll give it whatever you want. All these things will be added. Food, clothing, shelter, peace, everything. Someone said the cursing of the fig tree could practically be summed up this way. Like tree, like temple, like temple, like nation, like tree, like people. It's judgment and barrenness apart from the servant king. Now, in closing, and I am closing, 
may sound shocking to you, but I earlier said, you know, we have this paradigm that we're here to serve God. That was the paradigm that I was taught. And I'm rethinking it, folks. I, I think the starting point is wrong. Letting Christ serve us is the right paradigm. You see the difference? When He serves us, it's through us. And then we can do it to other people. That's what Peter, James, John, all the disciples had. To, that's what I think we have to relearn. And when we do that, then I believe He's on full display for everyone to see. Now I'm done. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I pray that you would forgive me for the times where I have tried to find uh, fruit in and of my own endeavors. Uh, we pray that you would forgive our church, family, and fellowship for uh, embarking on the same uh, fruitless experience. Uh, we thank you, Lord, that you have come uh, to serve each and every one of us to serve us up salvation and the Lord Jesus that we might be, uh, have the abundant life, that we might be fruitful in every way, uh, that the glory of Christ might shine from our life and our heart, that we might be able to serve others in this way. Uh, Lord, uh, may, you, uh, may we see this, uh, may we receive uh, you as servant king, uh, minister to our hearts, and service in a very, very abundant way that we might be fruitful uh, for others and be able to uh, touch them in that way as well. Uh, we thank you for this time. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.